All right. Good morning, church. Oh, you're alive. That's so good. You're awake. That's great. Man, it is so good to be with you this morning. This is my first time that I've been back since, um, since we reopened in June 14th. This is my first time I've gotten to teach with the adults, so this is great. I'm like so excited this morning, so thank you for being here. My name is Matt Densky. I'm the student ministry pastor here at Fellowship Greenville, and uh, I wanna welcome you to Fellowship this morning and just let you know how loved you are, and we believe that every person has a place to belong in the family of God. We're so thankful that you are here. So Auditorium One, welcome. Aud Two, welcome. If you're online, if you're streaming, welcome. We are so excited to worship together and to learn from Jesus's teachings this morning. Uh, over the summer, we've been going through a, a, a series which we've called Disciple, where we're exploring what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. And the graphic that we've been using throughout the entire series is this triangle. And what we're proposing is a disciple of Jesus is someone who has life with Jesus, life in community, and life on mission. And if this is your first time seeing this triangle, no problem, but if you're confused by any of these three, we've spent three weeks on each one of the corners. So you can go online, you can watch all the sermons and catch up. It's been a great, great series. Jim Thompson asked me if I would teach today and if I would kind of close out the Disciple series. I said, sure, I'd love to. Is there anything you want me to teach on? He said, no. And I was like, Awesome, I love that, okay? So uh, this is kind of free reign, and as I was praying about what to teach on this morning, I just felt so immediately drawn to two verses that I wanna spend some time looking at this morning out of the Gospel of John. Um, but we're gonna cover a lot of ground this morning. I just need to give you a fair warning and heads up. We've got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, so yeah, just I apologize, but at the same time, I'm really excited to get into it. So the plan is, let's zoom into these two verses, ask a few questions, look at what Jesus is teaching, wrestle with some of the conflict there, and then build some application. And then I wanna zoom out and kind of take a conceptual look at the life of Jesus to bring about some firm application. Does that sound good? Great, okay. <laughs> One yes, thank you. I'm, I'm applying your yes to everybody, so great. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was with my son, Trent, my oldest son. I have three. I just had a, a little girl two months ago. So we're like, yeah, woo. Yeah, we're like dying kind of, but it's a good, it's a good death. But uh, my oldest son, he's four and a half, and I love him for so many reasons. But one of the things I so admire about my oldest is he has this emotional capacity and emotional intelligence that, that is just beyond his years. He, he understands... Uh, people hurting and he asks great questions about suffering and things like that. And he's got a great capacity of his own for his emotions. The challenge of that sometimes can be his emotional capacity is so big, he doesn't know how to control those emotions. And so a few weeks ago, I was with him outside and we were in one of these times where he is having this volcano moment of just, just spewing magma and rock emotion, right? Like he's melting down. I have no idea why. I can't get it out of him. And I'm asking like, buddy, what's wrong? And he's not able to tell me. And it's just like the, the wailing ghost sound, Whoa, right? Like it's just, he's going and he's got tears streaming down his face. And so I find myself as a parent, like I'm sure most parents have been here, where you're simultaneously comforting and coaching at the same time. Right, so I'm, I'm like trying to comfort him. Buddy, it's okay, it's okay. And he's <laughs> right, like I have no idea what's going on. But as he keeps uh, getting higher and higher in his emotional state, I find myself trying to give him advice. Parents, you know what I'm about to say? I say, buddy, it's okay. Two words, calm down. <laughs> Great advice, right? Like totally comprehensible for a four and a half year old. Buddy, it's okay, calm down. And he's not calming down. And so I'm starting to get frustrated. I'm starting to get emotional. I'm like, why aren't you calming down, right? Like, so we're both in this state. And I'm like, buddy, it's okay, calm down. And I don't know, it just hit me. I had this moment of clarity. I don't know what it was, but in that moment, I just realized, Matt, nothing you're saying is actually helping him do what you're asking him to do. And while my son understands the words, calm down, and he would even be able to use them in context, he would be able to use a sentence and use those words in context, he doesn't know how to apply them in that moment. 
And so I decided, well, let me just show it. Maybe I can help him visually understand this. So I went inside, I got a cup and I filled it with water to the brim. I came back outside. I said, all right, buddy, here's what we're going to do. I want you to pretend like the water in this cup is like your feelings, like everything you're feeling is this water, okay? He's like, okay. I said, now I want you to walk from here to there without spilling a drop of water. And he's like, oh, okay. So he tries it and he spills water everywhere. And so he starts to laugh and I'm laughing. I'm like, no problem, buddy. So let me refill it. We filled it back up. And I said, this time I want you to do it, but I want you to skip. Like, I want you to try to do it skipping. And he's like, oh, okay. And so he skips, and the first skip, water's just up in the air, it's landing on him. He's laughing, I'm laughing. And so I said, hey, buddy, do you think daddy would be able to do it? And he was like, oh, yeah. So we filled it back up, and I had the cup, and I walked across our outdoor patio, and I didn't spill a drop. Very talented. And then I looked at him, and I'm like, do you think daddy could skip and do it? And he was like, oh, yeah. So I had the cup full of water and across our patio, I'm like skipping. And I'll be honest, I spilled a few drops, okay? But, but not a lot. And I went to him and I said, buddy, how was daddy able to keep most of the water in his cup? And his answer was brilliant. He said, because you're older. And I said, well, you're right. I, I have more experience trying to control it, but you know what else is, I knew how that water was gonna move and I adjusted my cup with it. And so buddy, I want you to pretend like your emotions are this water and when you feel them about to just splash out and when they get stirred up and they just wanna kind of spill over, I want you to try to adjust with them, just like we did with the cup. And so now he has this visual model and he's beginning to connect dots of what I'm meaning when I say calm down, control the water. But I realize all he's seen is someone do it. So is the solution he just has to wait till he's older to begin to control the water? So I realize he needs some tangible action steps that he's actually able to do at his age that he can understand. So I said, okay, so here's how we control our water, buddy. Here's how we keep our emotions in the cup, our feelings in the cup. Three things. I want us to count to 10 together. When you feel like your water is about to spill over, I just want us to pause and count to 10, and I'll do it with you. Second, I want us to smell the flowers and blow out the candle. You know what I mean? <sighs> Big breaths in and out. And then third, I want you to try to use words to Help me understand what you're feeling. So he's got these tangible action steps. And now, since that moment when he's getting upset and when the emotions start to pour over this four and a half year old who's got this great emotional capacity, I don't say calm down. Guess what I say? Let's control our water, buddy. I'm trying. Okay, have you counted to 10? No. <laughs> okay, have we smelled the flowers or blown out the camp? No. Okay, well, let's do those together. And so now he has the model of how to keep water in the cup, you adjust with the water, and he has the action steps of what to do in those moments. And now it makes sense. But before, just saying calm down was not helping anything. So why do I share this story? Because I think oftentimes we find ourselves in the same reality as my four-year-old son when it comes to different words. He knew the words calm down, but he didn't know their meaning. Which brings us to a principle this morning that, that I'd like to propose to us that I feel like sometimes, oftentimes, we know the words, but not what they mean. And we find ourselves in the same exact shoes of my four and a half year old. I mean, even take this series for instance, how many of us before this series felt like we had a pretty firm grasp on the understanding of disciple and what it means to be a disciple? But then after this series, after spending three weeks on each of the corners, we're like, man, I didn't know it was all that. I mean, how many words do we understand? But if someone were to come up to you and say, hey, can you actually define that? Like not how it's used contextually in a sentence, but define it. We find ourselves like, oh man, I've never had to do this before. And I'm proposing this morning that I think one of the words we do this with most often is the word love. And I know immediately you might be thinking, no, not love. We know love, come on. In the English language, 
love is defined by context, which surrounds it, right? So in other words, I can use the same exact word multiple times in a sentence, but the context gives it different meaning. For instance, I can tell you truthfully, I love tacos and I love my wife. Very different applications. The magnitude of depth is so different in those. Should be at least, hope so. <laughs> and you pick that up due to the context because you understand what I mean by words that aren't even there. It's implied. But when it comes to the Word of God, it was not written in English. It's been translated into English. And the Word of God was inspired in content, what is written, the words, and it was inspired in form, how it's written, the language. And the New Testament is written in Greek. The original writings were in Greek. And Greek doesn't just have one word for love, it has multiple words for love, and the New Testament authors employ those at different places. But guess what? In English, they just all translate to love. But in Greek, they have different specific meanings. And one word that I wanna look at this morning in the two verses we're gonna study is the Greek word agape, agape. It's translated as love, but the specific meaning is usually used as, by New Testament authors as a selfless love, an unconditional love, or a divine love. This is agape love. It's, it's of God. It's from God. It's selfless. It's unconditional. It's divine. See, I think we know the word, but how to apply it in the moment is, is something else entirely. And so I want us to jump in this morning to the Gospel of John. We're going to look at verse 34 and 35. And remember, we're going to zoom into these, spend some time in these, and then zoom out, kind of look at the life of Jesus as a whole. John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus is with his disciples. John 13 begins, verse 1 begins with Jesus knowing his hour had come. So Jesus is fully aware that this is his time, that he's about to be arrested, that he's about to be falsely accused and tried, and that he's about to be murdered. He's fully aware that his earthly mission has come to culmination. It is finalized. It is his time. He's aware of it. And therefore, everything he's about to do and say are done with the utmost importance and gravity. These are in some ways like his deathbed sentiments. These are the final hours that he has with his disciples. And the Gospel of John is written very uniquely. John, in the first 12 chapters of his Gospel, record and trace the first three years of Jesus' public ministry from the age of 30 to 33. And then at, ver at chapter 13 in his gospel, all the way through 21, John changes and he begins to record the final three days of Jesus's ministry. And so he goes from this, you know, zoomed out view where he's looking at all these events within years to now chapter 13, he's going in hours and he's recording the final half of his gospel in hours and days. Jesus knows his time has come. He's had this very interesting night with his disciples. He's inaugurated this, this meal where he's symbolically holding up bread and ripping it and saying, this is my body. And then he has a cup of wine and he's saying, this is my blood. And the disciples are experiencing this for the first time. And then he, he does something unthinkable Greatness of God goes to the, the deepest depths of humility where God in the flesh, King of kings, takes on the role of servant of servants and he takes off his outer tunic and he wraps a towel around his waist and he gets on his knees and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. That was the role of the house servant, not of the guests and certainly not of the Messiah. And yet Jesus is modeling this idea, this radical idea, the King of kings becomes servant of servants, and that was awkward. Peter's like, you're not doing this to me. <laughs> like, it was a very interesting dynamic. And then Jesus flows right into, hey, by the way, one of you will betray me tonight. Seems like only John heard that or heard who it was going to be at least. And then Jesus begins to teach on love. It's a very interesting night. These are his final hours. He has all these things and the disciples are experiencing this unique and confusing and awkward and and. What is going on? And Jesus begins to teach on love in the midst of all of this. John 30, uh, 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another 
just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That's our Greek word, by the way, agape. English translates it to love. It's the Greek word agape, selfless, unconditional, divine. You are to agape one another, just as I have agape you. Verse 35, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Great teaching. I think two of the most important verses in the New Testament. In fact, right after this, Jesus starts to teach a different train of thought. He comes back to this in John 15, but in, verse, in chapter 14, he begins to say, hey, by the way, guys, just remember where I'm going, you can't follow. I'm about to leave you. And they're like, what? We want to go too. And he's like, but I'm sending someone, the helper, the comforter, the spirit. It's actually better that I go and send him, and my spirit will not just be on you, but in you permanently as part of the new covenant. This new dynamic in the relationship with God. That's John 14. But in our two verses, he's teaching on love. So why are these so significant? Let's look. Let's look again. A new commandment I give to you. Pause. Pause. Time out there. Think about it from the disciples' perspective. You have been with this man for the past three years of your life. You, you've lived a nomadic life a homeless life, oftentimes just relying on the generosity of others. You've got kind of a home-based camp that you go back to, but then you come out of. You've given three years of your life to follow this guy, and you've seen him teach with this unspeakable authority. You've never seen anything like it. He commands the Word of God in such a way that you've never heard before, and it gathers the masses and also disperses the masses. It's too difficult at times for people. He's got the Pharisees on edge. They're disrupted and their whole system is being questioned. And he's got Rome on watch. The most powerful government in the world is curious about this prophet from the backwoods of Nazareth. You've seen him heal the sick and heal the blind and heal the crippled legs that have never worked in their lives before. You've seen him perform miracles and manifest bread out of nowhere. You've seen him teach in ways that have turned your understanding of God on its head. He's given value to women in that culture. He's elevated the value of children in that culture. Unthinkable for his day. He has power over the demonic realm and he's cast out demons and devils from people and delivered them in full victory. He commands the weather, which a Jewish understanding is only God can do that. Who is this guy? He's fulfilling prophecy after prophecy. Three years you've been with him and you've seen it all. And then on his final night, he leans in at the dinner table and he says, hey guys, come in. I have something new for you. I mean, can you imagine the, the anticipation of the disciples? Like, oh, what is it gonna be? What does he have that we've never seen before? Jesus is like, I've got something new. I've got a card, I've been holding it close to my chest, but now I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna lay it out. You've never seen it, you've never heard me teach it. This is brand new, are you guys ready? The disciples are like, yeah. And Jesus says, love each other. Love each other. What's the problem? Anyone have a question mark there? What's the problem? The concept of loving each other is not new. Jesus himself has taught this. Right? Jesus was questioned, what's the most important commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your soul, heart, strength, and mind. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them. Same word, by the way, agape. Love your enemies. Agape your enemies and pray for them. And these young Jewish men would have been steeped in Old Testament, especially the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And the book of Leviticus already teaches this. Love your neighbor. Love. Love each other. Love. It's already out there. It's already been taught. It's Old Testament even. So why does Jesus establish this as a new idea and a new commandment? There's tension here. There's confusion here. Jesus, what are you talking about? That's not new. I mean, can you imagine the disciples like, oh boy, uh, Peter, are you going to tell them or should I? <laughs> like, who's going to point this out? 
Nah, man, just let it roll. Let him tease. He's in, he's in a flow. What's new about the idea of love? It's confusing, right? Do you, do you feel that tension? Like, why would Jesus set this up as new if it's not new? So let's keep reading. Jesus says, a new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, but oh, 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 the back half of this verse. Just as I have loved you, you're to love one another like that. Oh, that's the new part. You see, up until now, it has never been taught this way. Up until now, the concept of love has in some ways been a subjective reality, up for interpretation, defined by the giver of love themselves. So when we say, hey, love your neighbor as yourself, most of us have some concept of what good love would look like. And if we achieve that level, we're like, I love people pretty well, right? We are the ones who define the meaning because it was kind of left open there. Love your neighbor as yourself. But never before in the history of humanity has divine spirit left his heavenly throne, put on flesh, become human, submitted himself to the most vulnerable form you could imagine, an infant being raised by teenagers, growing up as a man, living and walking among us, perfectly keeping the commandments of the Old Testament and perfectly modeling love to us. That has never happened before and will never happen again. Jesus became human and modeled perfect love. This isn't a, hey, love people in, in kind of how you define love. This is not that. This is, hey guys, think about all the ways that I've loved you. And if that were a reflection in a mirror, now I want you to think about how you love each other and think about that as a reflection in the mirror. And when you look at these reflections together, there should be no difference. We're to be loving one another like Jesus loves us. That's what's new. The standard is, is increased. There's no question. It's not room for interpretation. If you wonder if you are good at loving people, compare it to how Jesus is loved. And so hopefully you're feeling the tension here and the weight of this. Like, Jesus, who can do that? What are you talking about? Love like you loved, you're the perfect one, man. I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm lucky if I get through a day without sinning like 10 times, you know what I mean? Like, how can we do this? He goes on to say, by doing this, by the way, all people will know that you're my disciples. If you have agape, unconditional selfless, divine love for one another. See, up until this point, people have known that you're my disciple because you follow me physically. We travel all around Israel, and they see you with me, and you sit under my teaching, and you've followed me. That's how they've known you're my disciples. But going into John 14, I'm about to leave you. They're not going to be able to see me physically with you anymore. And so there's a new mark of a disciple. And it's not my physical presence. It's the manifestation of my love in you and through you. That's how people will know you're mine. It's a new way of thinking about it. I mean, this is like, what? Jesus, how and who is capable of doing this? So how you doing? Are you loving like this? I'm not. What is he saying here? By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. I mean, Jesus, the new mark of a disciple is love. I mean, Jesus is saying here, listen, it, 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 it's not like if you dress the right ways and if you're religious enough and if you, if you 
talk the right ways, if you go to church enough, it's not about your do-gooding, it's not about your rigid obedience, it's not about where you're from or where you grew up, it's not about your politics. None of those things will let the world know that you're mine. You know what will? Love. Love like Jesus, not worldly love, divine love. And all of those things have their place and they're important. John himself uses tons of language about obedience to Jesus is, is the proof of our following him. John 15, verse 8, bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. John 14, verse 15, uh, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. First John 2, verse 3, we, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Like John is all about obedience, but I think in John's mind, it's like because you love Jesus, the knee-jerk reaction, of course, would be to obey Jesus. Every religious structure on the planet would expect its followers to obey the moral code of that religion. Like, that's not distinctive. Jesus is saying, you want to know what is distinctive? Loving like I love. I mean, the world will look at that and say, whoa, those are Jesus' people right there. That's the mark of a disciple. That's the identifying mark of a disciple. To love like Jesus loved. How? How is that possible? How, how do we do that? So we kind of have the model. If we look at Jesus' life, we, we see what was modeled there. And just like I walked across the patio with the cup of water, I'm, I'm, I'm modeling it to my son. Jesus modeled what it looked like. But what are the action steps? Like, what are the tangible things that we can begin to apply that help us understand this now? Do we just wait until, like, we're in heaven and made new and, like, fully restored, and that's when we can love perfectly? Or do we begin to apply this now? What are the action steps? So if, if we were out at lunch or out at coffee together and you said, hey, Matt, when it comes to agape love, when it comes to divine love, selfless love, unconditional love, like, what would you describe as, like, the pillars of that or, or what needs to be present for that to be true? And I'd say, great question. <laughs> if we're talking about a kingdom community where, where people are saying, we believe in Jesus and we're coming together, marked by our love for Jesus, we're trying to create this community, we call it a church, where we're actually ushering in the realities of heaven here on earth, that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, which we prayed this morning, right? God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're asking for the realities of heaven to, to be present on earth. What are the action steps to create the reality of kingdom love and to create agape love in a kingdom community? I, I would suggest this morning, I think there are four. I think there are four action steps or four pillars of agape love in a kingdom community, and all four need to be present in order for love to be true. And so whatever your community is this morning, like if your main community is your small group, or if your main community is a, is a friend group, or your family, or if you're married in here, I would certainly say, yes, use these, please. Um, whatever your community is, use these things as a filter to evaluate the health of your community, your kingdom community. If we're trying to, to create the realities of heaven through agape love, which Jesus is saying, this is what it means, to be my disciple, then I would say, use these things as a filter to evaluate the health of your community. Four are necessary. The first one, I think, is trust. I think trust has to be present. If, if, if true love is gonna take place, trust has to be present. And trust is the foundational element of every relationship. It's foundational, you have to have it. Now, I don't have the exhaustive list for each one of these, but I've included two bullet points for each one that I think could help us better understand it. And so for trust, I think you have to have shared experiences and vulnerability. In other words, like let's just take the concept of a small group, for instance. You guys come together once a week. If that's your only experience together, then your shared experience is going to be limited to the depth of vulnerability that you achieve in that once a week meeting. So I know, I've been a part of them myself. How many small groups come together regularly, weekly, and they've been meeting for years, and they open up in the same way. How's, how's everyone doing? Good, 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 good. Great, we're all great, this is fantastic. 
and there's no depth, there's no vulnerability, there's no exposing the deep things in you or your fears or what you're wrestling with or where you just sinned or the things that are burdening you or weighing you down and the only times you come together or share life together is in the context of that specific meeting which doesn't seem very organic, so it's hard to actually build trust. But if, if we don't trust each other, think about it, I'm not gonna like, confide in you, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go deep with you, I'm not gonna delegate to you, I'm not gonna empower you, I'm not gonna rely on you. If, if trust is absent, love cannot be present. No relationship can, can flourish without trust. And the hard thing about trust, while love is free, hear me, while love is free, trust is earned and it's earned over time. The deposits go in so slowly, but they come out so quickly. They come out by the handful. If someone breaks your trust, whoo, you got a lot of repair work to do. But it's necessary for loving relationships. Trust is the foundation. The next pillar of a kingdom community oriented around agape love, I think, is communication. Now, all of these are simple in concept, but they're so hard to apply, right? Like, this is a marriage killer, by the way. Statistically speaking, a lot of marriages end because of communication issues, which is wild. Can't figure out how to communicate, so we just call it. Communication, and I think in communication, it, there has to be intentionality, and I think there has to be adaptability. So in other words, it doesn't just happen naturally. Some of it will, like shallow stuff, but I'm not talking about Hey, are we gonna have college football in the fall? What do you think? I'm not talking about another conversation about COVID. I'm not talking about like the surface level stuff. I'm talking about the deep stuff. If trust is the foundation of relationships, communication would be the navigation of relationships. It's how we actually navigate through this thing and build deeper levels of trust. Kingdom community communication would look something like, because we have trust with one another, we will step into the hard conversations. We will embrace conflict with one another. We will have accountability with one another. I will confess my sins. If I sinned against you, I'll come and confess and ask for forgiveness. I will repent in the community. We will talk about the hard things. I'll confront you if I think you're in the wrong. If you hurt my feelings, I'll come and tell you about it. I'm not just gonna ball it up and pretend like I'm fine, but deep down now I don't trust you and it's severing our relationship, but I pretend that we're cool. No, that's not kingdom, that's world. Communication says, man, there are things we've gotta talk about. We've gotta clarify expectations. We've gotta talk about our feelings and emotions. We've gotta say we're sorry and ask for forgiveness. It's gotta be intentional and there has to be adaptability because think about it. 10 years ago, I learned how to communicate to a college girl that I was dating. A few years after that, I had to relearn how to communicate to my fiance because priorities changed and life changed. A few years after that, I had to relearn how to communicate to my wife because life changed again. People changed again. A few years after that, I had to relearn how to communicate to the mother of my child. And now I'm having to learn how to communicate to the mother of my three children. Like, where do we find the time? Life changes, your circumstances change, your priorities change, therefore communication has to adapt. It can't just be, you know, when we were like young and first married, we could talk so easily. I don't understand the problems now. Well, you've got to adapt. You've changed, life has changed. Intentional and adapt. Communication, it's the navigation of relationships. Third, kingdom community oriented around agape love, the third action step I think is commitment. Now all of these are modeled by Jesus. You look at his life, this is what we're doing. We're zooming out, we're taking the tenets of his ways of loving. Commitment, he says I'll, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, I'm with you forever. And commitment, I think, needs both endurance and hope. If trust is the foundation and communication is the navigation, commitment would be the strength of the relationship, like the cement that holds it together. So when I do premarital counseling with couples and we walk through you know, months leading up to their wedding, I talk heavily about this idea because the concept of falling in love, I'm just not bought into. Falling is 
a verb of accidental action. Usually you tripped and you fell, right? So if you can fall in love, you can just as easily fall out of love, some accidental loss of emotions. I just don't think that's true. I think love is a choice that you give or you choose to withhold. Now, are you infatuated? Do you have emotions? Are you swept up in the feelings? Of course, that's why the first three to six months are awesome. That's why it's so easy to love but then comes the test. Now you've got to begin to figure out, whoa, how do we actually remain committed now that we're discovering things that we don't like about each other and that we're having conflicts with one another and that we're confused by one another. We seem to be arguing more and more. What is going on? Commitment says, I will hope for better times and endure through the hard times. I am in this. I will not bail when it gets hard. Same thing in kingdom communities small group, friend groups, family groups, it's gonna get hard. But if we have patterns of like friend hopping where it's like, ah, it got hard, I just left and started a new small group. Or, ah, it got hard, so we broke up. That was like my 12th relationship this year. I'm just gonna keep doing it until I find one that's easy. No! Commitment says, I will hope for better and endure through the hard. It's a decision, it's a conscious discipline because listen, married people in the room, you know it's not always easy to love your spouse. The feelings aren't always there. There are some mornings you wake up and you're like, I just don't feel it today. It's hard today. A lot of that's our own stuff coming to the surface. But commitment says, I will choose love in the midst of the absence of feeling. It's endurance and it's hope. It can't be based on feelings alone. Feelings are fleeting, temporary. Commitment is the strength of a relationship. Kingdom community says, man, we will commit to this. And the last and fourth pillar of agape love, I believe, is integrity. Integrity is the personal quality of character that each person is bringing into the group or relationship. Integrity needs both consistency and character. You can't be one way in private and another way in public. You can't claim things in public and not believe them in your heart. That's inconsistent. It's a quality of character. It comes into the relationship assuming the best of others and wanting the best for others. It means you don't slander or gossip or talk poorly behind people's backs, and then when you're with them, you act like you're their best friend. That's inconsistent. And in a kingdom community, that type of behavior actually begins to corrode the community itself. There's a lack of integrity. If trust is the foundation and communication is the navigation, if commitment is the strength, then integrity would be the stability of the relationship. How stable is this thing? Because even one inconsistent person who tries to disqualify someone else's character by diminishing their own in the ways they talk will actually begin to destroy the community. So think about your relationships. Use this as a filter. How are we doing? Think about relationships that have failed or communities that have failed or friendships that have just gone. Which one of these was absent? I guarantee it's one of these four. So this is how it would actually work in like a real life scenario. Let's say you're part of a group, relationship, friend group, small group, marriage, whatever. You have trust because you've had shared experiences and vulnerability. There's some level of trust but something happened and it hurt you and it confused you and you're like, man, I'm so confused because that person typically doesn't do that or act that way, but they, I heard this or, or I felt this and now I'm confused and so now you're at a crossroads. But because you have trust and because you're committed to them, you decide, man, I'm gonna have a hard conversation. I'm actually gonna flesh this out. Hey, you did that, it hurt me, it confused me. What did you mean by that? And then they get the chance to speak and you get to hear them and it may just dismiss whatever you had in mind and it's like, oh, oh man, I, I was actually way off. Now I understand because I've heard your perspective. And they prove their character even more. And now that's deep in trust all the more. That's how kingdom relationships are supposed to operate. That's what agape love would look like in action. Trust, communication, commitment, and integrity. The pillars, the action steps of kingdom communities oriented around agape love. So the question, coming back to our passage, is how is that possible? 
Because having those four up on screen and you're seeing the language and you're seeing the words, you may be sitting there like, dude, I, that's not, <laughs> that does not describe my relationships. How can we do that? Coming back to Jesus' teaching in verses 34 and 35. I think Jesus has given us two things. I think he's given us the model and I think he's given us the means. Just like with my son, I showed him how to do it and I gave him the action steps. I broke it down for him. I think Jesus has given us the model and given us the means. In other words, Jesus showed us what this love looks like with his life and Jesus has filled us with his spirit to empower us to actually love like this. In other words, these four, trust, communication, commitment, and integrity, are descriptive of kingdom communities oriented around agape love. But if the Spirit of God is not present, I don't think it can be accomplished. Because divine love, agape love, divine love is only possible through divine presence. Which I think is why Jesus immediately starts teaching in John chapter 14 about the Spirit. I'm sending someone. I'm giving you my Spirit. I'm placing my Spirit in you. The hope, the comforter, the peace of God is in you, empowering you to actually fulfill this standard of love. It's not through our own strength, it's through the presence of Jesus' spirit in us. So we have a model and we have the means. He showed us with his life and he's filled us with his spirit. We achieve divine love for one another through the presence of the spirit in us based on the model of Jesus. And by doing this, all people will know that we're disciples. So to wrap up our disciple series, thinking about that triangle again, life with Jesus, life in community, and life on mission. If we were to apply the com concepts from this morning, I think it would sound something like this. Having been filled with the Spirit through our faith in Jesus, that's the top of the triangle, life with Jesus. Having been filled with the Spirit through our faith in Jesus, creating the realities of kingdom love on this earth with one another, that's this corner, life and community, all people everywhere will know that we are disciples of Jesus. That's the other corner, life on mission. People looking into this community saying, wow, they've got something, there's something there that we don't have. They love each other like we've never seen. They're Jesus people. Having been filled with the Spirit through your faith in Jesus, creating the realities of kingdom love on this earth with others, all people everywhere will know that we are disciples of Jesus. Jesus says, love like I've loved. Well, how is that possible? I've shown you and I've given you my Spirit. That's how it's possible. May we be people who are known for our love more than anything else, more than any other defining factor, may our love be what people know us for. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. It is uh, so hard sometimes, man. But Jesus, you've empowered us to be obedient to your word by showing us what you meant through your own life and by giving us the power to do it through your spirit. Jesus, may we be a people known for our love. You said that's the mark of a disciple in the new covenant. Let us be people who love like you loved, Jesus, building communities of trust and communication and commitment and integrity. We ask this, Jesus, in your name, through the power and presence of your spirit in us. Amen.